property. We'll have a chance to review this later. And you know, the, there'll be a transcription, an auto transcription as well um, that you can, you know, use as a reference to help you track what, what is said at today's meeting. I'm going to prepare, uh, make this presentation available, the PowerPoint, uh, and then there'll be a link to this video uh, posted on our YouTube channel. So um, for anybody who's watching this later because you weren't able to attend, uh, that's where we do it. Um, but also just to make it available for the public as well. Um, because this is a, uh, a public meeting. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Tom Jackman, uh, the Rules Coordinator for the Siting Division uh, here in the Oregon Department of Energy. Uh, this is the first RAC meeting for the uh, amendment uh, rulemaking. And uh, it's quite a few years, or at least we, we have pretty small rulemaking uh, groups, uh, but so this is a relatively big one for the Siting Division. Um, I, I don't, I don't know the best way to, um, to do introductions, but I do think it would be helpful for, um, people to know who, who everyone is. So uh, there's, there's some members of the public here and also some staff here as well. i for time and just for my own sanity, or I'm just going to have the, um, people who are, were notified that they're on the rack are, are going to do introductions right now. So. Um, let's see, um, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's the best way to do this. I don't want, uh, actually, uh, so what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just go down the list. So, um, three, six, oh, one. So that was, uh, Georgia McNabb. Can you, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so just tell us who you are and then kind of wh why you're on the rack. Like, what do you represent? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm Georgia McNabb, Sherman County uh, Planning Director. And um, I guess I joined just to maybe get back up to speed on, you know, FSEC mm -hmm. making and amendment process and, um, since the you know COVID, I haven't had much interaction with Department of Energy. Yeah, um, this you're actually the first because we we invite all the counties ever for for all of our rulemaking. So you are the first non uh, person outside of uh, you know uh, Brendan's joined a few times for, uh, as part of the Association of Oregon Counties, but we haven't actually had a specific county rep join before. So that's great. It's really good to have you here um, to provide that sort of county perspective. Um, I, so I have I have a rack list here. I'm just going to actually go down it and. That'll probably be the easiest thing. So uh, I noticed Lena's here. Do you want to introduce yourself and uh, let us know who you represent? My name is uh, Lena Ke Lena Cope, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, and I work for no problem. <laughs> um, I work for Portland General Electric, and we hold multiple site certificates um, through FSEC. Um, so obviously, very interested in amendment rulemaking. All right, thank you, Lena. <laughs> I uh, Andy, can you? Are you here? Any Bauer? No. Okay. Um, uh, is Patrick? Yeah, Patrick, you're here. Can you let us know who you are? Absolutely. I'm Patrick Collins with Umatilla Electric. Uh, we're the utility provider providing power in parts of Morrow and Umatilla County. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, David, uh, can you let us know who you are? Yep. <clears throat> David Lawler and I uh, am the executive director for development for Next Era Energy Resources in the Northwest, and I represent uh, Next Era Energy Resources that holds a lot of site certificates and has done many amendments um, over the last several years. All right, uh, I think I saw Jack uh, Watson join. Can you let us know who you are? Yeah, hi everybody, Jack Watson. I and the policy director for the Oregon Solar and Storage Industries Association. We represent a number of developers who are active participants at FSEC and hold site certificates. All right. Um, so I think Emily Griffith or Max Green, did, did one of you join? 
Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. I'm Emily Griffith. I'm the Oregon Policy Manager for Renewable Northwest. We're a renewable energy advocacy nonprofit, and we have uh, developer members and environmental and consumer advocate members. Um, and many of our developer members also hold FSEC site certificates. Thanks. Uh -huh. uh, Paul Hicks, are you on? Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Paul Hicks. I'm with uh, Tetra Tech, a uh, consulting engineering firm. Um, we have worked um, regularly with many applicants uh, on supporting development of uh, FSEC amendments. Uh, myself, uh, a senior uh, project manager and land use planner, and look forward to uh, being involved in the, the process. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and then I believe, was it Dan, were you here on, on behalf of Association of Oregon Counties? Yeah, I'm uh, Dan Dorn, you Phillips County. I just uh, came off the bed for Brandon for this meeting. Uh, I'll probably attend future meetings, but Brandon, the official AOC here. All right, thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, John from uh, DLCD. Can you introduce yourself? You bet. Thank you, guys. John Jennings. I'm the Community Services Specialist with Park Conservation Development here in Redmond, Oregon, right now. Uh, good to see everybody. See some real familiar faces, and, and some looking forward to getting a little more, a little better. Um, our interest here is is really to to listen and and pick them where we can, help where we can. And to you know really continue what we think is a, a good history of state agency coordination between uh, DLCD and Odo. Thanks, thanks for having us, Tom. Uh huh. Thanks for being here, John. Um, and then I so there's a few phone numbers on here. Obviously, I don't recognize. Uh, is Irene here? I know you had to call in, or she let me know um, she had to call in. Uh, is it Star Three? You can just talk. I mean, this is the, that's for the WebEx. This is the Teams meeting, so. Just let her, you know, go for it. All right. Um, Irene, if you if you figure out how to. We can't really hear you, so I, I know you said you had to call in from a remote location because you were um, otherwise unavailable. Uh, if you're able to uh, to talk later, just let us know. Um, so, Don Hildebrand, are you here? No. Oh, yeah. He he said he wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, and then Yvonne, could you let us know who you are? Yep, Yvonne Scott, Lynn County. I'm just um, part of the public with a lot of people that want to know how and why and what's going on here with all the new energy yep uh just and also just for a little bit more background we the reason why we reached out to you is because you had previously you know shown interest in participating by providing public comment after a notice of intent was issued um, by an energy developer so um we're always yeah. looking for people who, who want to be engaged and that was you and then i believe yeah. i saw jessica um on could you introduce yourself yeah, hi, I'm Jesper Nadini. I'm an attorney at Tonkin Torp um, here in Portland. Uh, previously at another firm, I was representing investor owned utilities um, in the FSEC process. Now I mostly work with smaller renewable developers and energy justice advocates. Um, so I'm not really representing anyone in particular here, but just trying to bring my broad perspective of my involvement in FSEC to the rulemaking process. Yeah, uh, super excited to have you here, Jessica. You have a very unique perspective, for sure. Uh, and then uh, is Rudy, he's not, yeah, I can see he's not in. So uh, we also have uh, Rudy uh, Salicori uh, is a member of the RAC. He represents Friends of the Columbia Gorge. Um, and uh, as you can see, we have a pretty broad, uh, diverse group of um, RAC members. And I'm hopeful that we can, we're not, we are for sure not going to all agree with every you know proposed solution about how to address uh, various issues that the RAC is going to identify. Um, but I'm hopeful that uh, as a result of your participation, I'm very confident that 
the, the, the final outcome will be something that I personally am, am more proud of uh, as a result of your participation. I, I have not had a rack yet where, you know, participation didn't meaningfully improve the rules in some fashion. So I'm excited to see how you guys are able to contribute. Um, so let's see. Um, all right, let's get into it. So, so many of you are familiar with the rulemaking process, but not uh, all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, the council who uh, runs the energy siting uh, group in Oregon uh, and is appointed by the governor. Uh, and they are, they are volunteer members, for those of you who don't know, it's a very interesting way of doing business, uh, it's, but relatively common for uh, state government. Um, they are the ones who sort of appoint and direct what we work on uh, in terms of the rulemaking. So we, we sort of pitch where we think we should go and then they say, yeah, we agree or yes, we don't. So we, they, they approved this rulemaking back in February uh, at a council meeting and they also approved the uh, formation of the RAC. So uh, that we are here at their um, bequest. So, um, Let's see. So we're now here. We're, we're now in the development of draft proposed rules phase. And just to be crystal clear, because I know there's been some confusion with uh, sort of prior rulemakings, sometimes staff sort of develop, has an idea, there's a problem. We, we sort of, it's pretty obvious, at least in our mind, what the solution needs to be, but we still want to, we don't want to just um, skip the rack process to become more and more important um, uh, as sort of rulemaking develops year by year here. Uh, but that um, in those rulemakings, the rulemaking advisory committee really is an advisory committee um, that's there to sort of make sure that we're that the rules, the, the draft rules we're developing are uh, appropriate and they make sense and all that good stuff. This rack is going to be is going to be more in the weeds. We're going to uh, I'm going to be relying on this rack uh, more with the development of draft proposed rules, unlike some of the prior racks I've done. Staff has, we have no draft rules. There's no draft rules. So there's a ton of, as you see, we're, I mean, we've identified a lot of issues and I'm sure uh, you all hopefully have um, thought about this and and uh, have perhaps identified some additional issues. Uh, we have not proposed solutions for any of those issues. Um, so this is sort of a different, going to be a different experience for me. I'm excited uh, to, you know, have a more, um, hopefully, a, um, Involved rack uh, that sort of gets in the gets into it a little bit more. So I'm uh, it'll be it'll be it's kind of a new experience for me, and I'm I'm hopeful a good one. Um, so all right, let's um, just so you know, the, uh, here's the my sort of proposed um, uh, amendment rulemaking schedule. I really have no great sense of, uh, and it's I'm sort of going to be responsive to the rack itself about how this actually plays out. This is just a possible schedule. So today we're gonna to go over the rulemaking and scope. If the group sort of already has a good, has an idea of like issues and, um, you know, various things that they wanna work on, I'm gonna propose that we sort of start to work on solutions for those and, and potentially discuss those at the next meeting. If we're not quite there yet, we might um, bump what is currently released uh, as rack two here at uh, another, to a, you know, rack three, um, and then likewise, once we start developing some draft language, I have two meetings here. It could take three or even four meetings, um, or I don't know. I don't have a specific number in mind. It's going to take however long it takes. Um, that being said, um, I don't have any, like I said earlier, uh, illusions that that what the final product is going to be something that everyone's going to love to you know to the same degree, um, you know certain uh, interests that are involved in this process want basically diametrically opposed outcomes. Um, so we're not gonna just keep holding racks until everyone is in total agreement. Um, as long as there's some sort of value and we're sort of developing kind of the nature of what the problems are uh, and sort of what the what the possible solutions could be, uh, I do think there's a, there's a value in continuing to hold meetings. Once we're sort of spinning our wheels, um, at that point, I'm gonna, you know, say thanks, thanks for the help. Uh, staff will sort of develop a, a final set of draft rules um, for review by the rack, 
and then we'll take it to the council. Uh, at which point, you'll then have a second opportunity to participate as just a member of the public in the public uh, comment period. Did anybody have any questions about sort of the schedule, the, the rulemaking process, how this is going to go down? Um, you'll have plenty of opportunities in this meeting. And then just also, you can always reach out to me uh, offline if you have any questions. OK, um, let's get let's get into it. So um, many of you or several of you, I should say, uh, have participated in the amendment process um, multiple, multiple times. Um, some of you, not so much. I'm just going to sort of briefly go over this. Uh, it starts with a preliminary request for amendment. Um, a site certificate holder, somebody who's already gone through the, uh, the FSEC process and has been given um, uh, a certificate for to, to operate an energy facility has a need or sees a need to alter an existing certificate. Maybe they want to change the site boundary. Maybe they want to uh, enlarge um, the, the size or the output of the facility. Uh, we've had amendments for wind projects that want to add solar. Um, so there's all types of uh, request types. And actually, what is a, an amendment is going to be a question that I'm hoping the RAC can sort of help. Um, it's going to be one of the things that we're going to be looking at. So at the moment, we have uh, we do what's called a type A, type B determination. And essentially, that's the fast track, uh, slower track. Um, type B being the super easy, simple uh, amendments, and then type A being the sort of more complex amendments. Um, this was created in 2017, is going to be yet another uh, topic of discussion, which we'll get to in a second. Um, once we uh, have reviewed the uh, materials and decided that they're, they're, everything has been submitted that is needed to be submitted for review, that it's deemed, the application is deemed complete, and staff cr uh, creates a draft proposed order, um, at which point uh, public comment begins. Uh, and the public has an opportunity to, uh, yes, comment on it. So just, uh, and then you'll see that at the first box here, there's a public notice box. Um, but as, you tell, as we'll discuss later, um, there is not a, uh, unlike uh, the regular application process, um, there isn't a formal sort of notice of intent uh, sort of waiting and public comment period that is part of the traditional application. So that's one of the differences of the amendment process. Um, so we have a proposed order and uh, the uh, proposed order then becomes final unless there uh, is a contested case, uh, which for amendments is not is not automatic. So if no, uh, currently not automatic. There's If there are no um, requests to participate in a contested case, then it just proceeds to uh, a final order and the statute gets amended. So any questions about the amendment process? Anybody? Okay. Okay, so the question I had working on this, and just so you know, I'm, I've, I'm a two year, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be two years in November. Uh, so not even two years, one, a little over a year and a half uh, member of the siting team. I, you know, I've, and I've never, I mean, I'm the rules coordinator. I've never actually, you know, handled an amendment. So my first question was, why do we even have an amendment process? So the council could just require all applications for amendments to follow the exact same process as, an, as just any other application. Because ultimately the amendment has to meet the exact same standards of the original project. You, there, just because you're an amendment doesn't mean that you don't have to protect, you know, for wildfire fires or impacts on, you know, fish and wildlife or you know cultural resources or whatever. Um, so why do we have? What's the whole? What's the reason for having a separate process if the standards are the same? Um, so one reason is, and for those who didn't know, it's because we can. So there is sort of a broad statutory framework. Um, the council operates under statutory direction and can only do what the statute says they can do. Um, but there is pretty broad allowance for handling amendments. Um, in ORS 469-405, it, 
it just basically says that a site certificate may be amended with approval of the Energy Facility Siting Council. And there are some additional statutes um, related to like, um, you know, ga expanding gas facilities and some other things, but there, there are way fewer, there's way fewer direction on the amendment process than there is for uh, the original application. So one reason why we have an amendment process is, is because we can't, otherwise, obviously we could not. Um, so this, this again, the question still remains, why have an amendment process? You, you know, even though we can, we don't have to. Um, and a couple of reasons, and these make sense. Substantial site review has been done as part of the initial application. So it makes sense that, you know, an amendment should, you know, there should be some efficiencies there. There's no reason to have more complex, you know, expensive, uh, time consuming processes if we don't need to. If we can protect the public and do it in a more efficient manner uh, and save the utility, save the applicant money, there's, then we should, I mean, we are, I feel like we're obligated to do that. There's, you know, wherever we can provide a more efficient um, process for the public, uh, we should, uh, assuming that we can, we can still um, meet the same goals and standards uh, and protect and protect the resources in the same way. So, uh, to me, that's sort of the big the big answer. And so, the amendment process allows site certificate holders to make changes to a site certificate in a more efficient manner. But again, it still requires all changes to the site certificate to adhere to existing state standards and regulations. Um, and so, then you might ask, well, what is the difference? And uh, there are basically four main differences. So as I alluded to earlier, there's no notice of intent phase for an amendment, which is where um, you basically you know let people in the area know that a project is coming through various uh, notice requirements. You know, put things in in a local newspaper and so on and so forth, uh, and then hold a NOI you know public hearing, provide opportunity for public comment. That's so that's a big difference. This there is no NOI. There are notice requirements but it's essentially you know an email blast and then the, the developer moves along so that's that is a big difference uh, number two throughout the process there are reduced notice requirements the statute you know for notice requirements for a regular application are pretty extensive and whether or not we think they make sense they're in the statute so we follow them um, they're less onerous or unspecific for an amendment process and so we're you know, where it makes sense, we've sort of streamlined it. And potentially, as part of this process, we might want to streamline it even more. Uh, the third difference is that there's a higher bar for someone to be a party to a contested case. Essentially, the difference is that you can't just have, for a regular application, you have to have raised an issue uh, with sort of sufficient specificity, as we say, in the rules. And that really just means that you've basically identified an issue and you've, you know, raised some facts uh, that would support that issue. Uh, that's really all it means. For But for an amendment, you have to have raised an issue and, and basically provide enough facts. And it has to be the, the, uh, significant enough that that council, that it would have, that it, the hearing officer or the council determines that it would potentially change their uh, view on an issue. Um, so it's just a, it's a higher bar. And frankly, uh, it is, it isn't met very often. So if you're in on the amendment track, there's much, you're much less likely to uh, see a contested case. Um, and that is very attractive for developers. So uh, they're very interested in, in, you know, the amendment process, I think, for that reason. Uh, and fourth, uh, after 2017 revamp of the amendment rules, a type A, type B track was created, uh, as I talked about previously. So you could potentially be on, uh, your amendment could be deemed type B, which shrinks things down even more. And it's really just quicker timelines, reflective of the fact that you have quality, you have basically your project or amendment has been designated as a as a simpler, easier to review um, amendment. So therefore, we can have quicker timelines. Um, any questions about 
these items or what it means to file an amendment versus just a regular application. As you can see, there's not like 50 differences. I mean, and if you if you go back and look at the slide of the of the amendment process, it sort of tracks the application process with a draft proposed order, the public comment, um, the final order, possible contested case. That's all the same as uh, as an actual amendment. So these these four items here um, can be significant, but it's not like there's a thousand differences. Um, but do a we do have a whole. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's Yvonne Scott. I have a question. So I'm sure. trying to follow up because I'm on the phone and I'm not online to see it. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. But um, looking at the whole amendment versus an NOI. So when you're looking at that, there's no public comment. And there's actually, there's nothing that's given to the public. Right now we have notices, which are newspaper, which are actually so inefficient because no one really reads the newspaper. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, and to get that information out to the public, which would stop the problems maybe going forward to have the contested cases or send something to, you know, the state of Oregon through the Sunshine Act or something like that, um, that would help also the developers not spend all that money in an area maybe they shouldn't be at. So I'm just wondering, is that what you're saying? This amendment is there is no public um, information or notice given out when their amendments are given? So there is a notice. It's just that there's no public comment period. So there is there is a required public notice that's that goes out to the people that sign up to receive notices. Um, uh, and but unlike with the NOI, where you would have a public comment period, there is no public comment period for amendments after the notice is issued. Something we okay, can talk so about as for the public. Yeah. Can they go back later? Then that would be something they would just do to contested case then. If the amendment would change or what they have to go through the state of Oregon through like sunshine or something like that. Sorry, I didn't I didn't follow your your question. What was your question? So if there wasn't um for a public comment on that and an mm -hmm. amendment was just made, okay, and then moving forward. Yep. yep. Then what is the public to be able to come back for that amendment? Do they just go after that later for a change going through? So there's the still a case? there's still a a public comment period with an amendment. It's just not, it's not at the beginning. So with a regular application, you have a public okay. comment period after the initial notice. And then there's a, the public comment period after the um, draft proposal order is issued. So for an amendment, it's just after the draft proposal order. So you still have an opportunity to comment um, and raise issues um, and potentially be involved in a contested case, just um, not at the beginning of the project. I got it now. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so uh, I just have a little uh, information slide here that I thought might be uh, interesting and it's something we're still looking at, but this is just so you have an idea. Since 2017, when the Type A B tracks were created, we've had uh, 27 amendments. 16 of those were deemed Type A and 11 of those were deemed Type B. There's also a Type C, which nobody has ever asked to be on, and uh, we will uh, as such, I considered on the chopping block, but we'll we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you can see the type Bs are shorter, six months on average, and type A is 10 months on average. But one of the th questions I have is, are they shorter because type B is like more efficient, or are they shorter because type B was, those projects or those amendments were already simpler? And if we hadn't bothered with the type A, type B, those amendments would have been seven months. Like, how much time are we really saving by having the uh, a type B track? Given it takes a lot of time and energy to make this determination. So is the time and energy spent determining whether an amendment is type A or type B? If we just went straight into uh, doing the amendment, would would that actually be more efficient? So I, I hope I'm, that question makes sense. But uh, yeah, it's, it's something that we're definitely thinking about and, and want to look at. So what is the scope of this uh, rulemaking? So to be clear, it's it's primarily the language in, uh, in the OAR 345 Division 27. However, it also could potentially include other sort of like tertiary language that maybe re directly references the amendment uh, process. There's like a rule in uh, Division 15 that uh, in the contested case section that specifically talks about the contested case board amendment 
Uh, I think that's up for up for grabs. So it's primarily going to be the stuff in Division 27, uh, which I emailed to everybody uh, last week. But if there is some other sort of like, oh, hey, there's this rule over here that's directly connected to the amendment process, but not in Division 27, that's within the scope as well. So anything related, directly related to the, the council's amendment process is, uh, is up for grabs here in terms of what, you know, what we're looking at. And the objectives are, are pretty straightforward. That The uh, solutions are going to be more complicated, but we want to make the rules more clear. That's always my goal. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of years, it's been five years since the 2017 uh, rulemaking went out. And that was a pretty complex, gnarly rulemaking. Uh, you know, were there some unintended consequences of that rulemaking? Were there some things we didn't foresee? Uh, some ambiguities, you know, now that we've had experience implementing those rules for the last five years. Uh, how can we make the rules more clear? Number two, sort of related, but not as, uh, is how do we, can we improve the process? Are there certain parts of the amendment process where we, where we have more flexibility because it's not as prescripted by statute um, to make the process more efficient while still protecting the, the public? Uh, and number three, this is sort of required, but, uh, you know, ensuring that we comply, do the current rules uh, comply with any new statutes or, or revised rules or other recent direction from the courts? So, and then outside the scope is just stuff that's not related to the amendment process. Uh, does, does anybody have any questions about the scope of this uh, rulemaking? All right, as you can see, it's pretty broad. Okay, so I'm now going to go through some slides here, which is basically, you know, staff has spent some some time, some meaningful chunks of time here, going through the amendment rules and sort of identifying like, well, there's this is confusing, this this could be tweaked, we should probably make this better. But again, like, no, no actual drafting of language has occurred, uh, and so it's just sort of like a, a, a an issue spotter. And I'm going to go through, I want to say the, the main ones, not everything that we've looked at, um, just to kind of give you an idea of like what, what we want to look at, what we want you to look at. Um, but I'm, I'm, if there are any things that we missed or any other additional issues that you are concerned about, then absolutely, this is the, this is the time and place to raise those. All right. So as we said, and I'm not going to spend a whole a lot more time on this. Um, one of the things the RAC needs to do is determine whether type A, type B, type C determination process is worth the effort. So it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of resources to go through that process. We gotta you know, do some analysis, present in front of council. During that time, we could just be processing the amendment. So is the, is the effort extended resulting in an overall efficiency gain? We could just provide more flexibility in the rules so that if, if an amendment really isn't that complicated, we just have one track, but the track sort of provides the flexibility to move things quicker if an amendment is more straightforward, rather than having multiple tracks. Um, so, uh, you know, we need rules guiding the return of sites to useful non-hazardous condition. There isn't really anything in the amendment process uh, that di directly addresses this issue. Um, staff has identified a need or some additional rules to cover partial retirement of a, of a facility. It's not really anything in there right now. So if you if you have an amendment and you basically you know you have let's say I'm just going to make these numbers up you know 500 megawatts of wind turbines and you want to you know decommission 200 of them and then uh, you know add some solar. Uh, there's nothing in there about the decommissioning of well, or partial retirement of the facility. Jessica, yeah, you yeah, your hand up. Yeah, can you go back to the prior slide? I feel like we sure. may have prematurely moved Move off to that the next one. slide. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So okay, yeah. no, I I guess maybe you did hit all the points. Okay, I just wanted to read through it once more. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And uh, I will be making this again the presentation available. So if um, at least for these slides, I'm not looking for. Uh, I mean, so any solutions at this point or any sort of deep analysis, I do want to make sure that you understand what it is that the, you know, the issue that's being raised here um, so that you can sort of start doing your own thinking about potentially how you feel like, you know, maybe you feel like this isn't an issue or um, 
you agree that it's an issue and you feel like we should do A or B or C or whatever. Um, okay, so staff feels we should clarify what site changes should trigger the amendment process. This is a big one. So, uh, well, you know, and then there, because there is, it does describe it now, but it's sort of hard to implement, hard to apply. Uh, so is there is there something we can do to make this more straightforward? This is always going to be a tricky thing. Um, there's no, we can, you know, make things really flexible, but then they're vague, or we can be very prescriptive, but then it sort of locks things out in the, unintentionally in the future. It's just always a challenge with rules um, about how best to um, categorize things. It's one of the reasons why the type A, type B thing is, 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 a, is a pain point, because it involves a lot of analysis of like, well, does it does this meet this threshold? Does that meet that threshold? Um, when things aren't crystal clear, like everything over this megawatt is this, uh, it it's just opens the door for confusion. Um, and it's a kind of a sub question for this is, what if the proposed amendment is the size of a project that would by itself trigger mandatory FSEC review? Um, I, you know, based on their sort of the, my thinking to this point, there's, I think there's good arguments for saying that should, you know, why not have that be an amendment? It's still, we still, it's still part of the same site, you know, basic location. There's still some, we should still recognize some efficiencies uh, and recognize that a lot of work's already been done. Um, but then also, on the other hand, if it's that big, like maybe we should sort of provide the additional, you know, opportunity for public comment. Maybe we should, you know, slow things down a, a smidge. Um, so I'm very, I'm sure there's going to be very strong opinions about changing rules around that. Um, but uh, yeah, so be, be thinking about that one for sure. Um, all right, so we we probably need some additional rule language to address issues around um, the timing and the substance of the pre-amendment conference. The way it's laid out in the rules right now, it's sort of maybe doesn't make a you know total sense with when it occurs and what happens at the pre-amendment conference. So yes, be, be thinking about that. Um, see. So there's a need to sort of modernize, uh, uh, you know, the application submission requirements. It, like I said before, there's not, hard, you know, there's frustratingly little flexibility for the regular application process. You know, uh, the rules are sort of stuck in time, I think. But with the amendment process, we can sort of recognize that, you know, it's 2024 and people don't do things the way they did, you know, when the when the sort of siting division was created many decades ago. So we can reflect that in how things are you know, how we require applicants to submit things and um, so on and so forth. So uh, there's there's various rules. I have, you know, just an example here that maybe aren't in the right spot or do we even need that rule? So I would definitely um, think, think about that as you sort of do your own review of the rules. Um, we certainly are. Um, consider, the staff's considering that we should probably have rules on how project descriptions site certificates get updated based on what is actually built uh, and do so without uh, requiring an amendment. Uh, so, you know, if a developer says, well, we want to, you know, build a project that looks like this, that has this much stuff, uh, and they only build half of it, and, you know, 10 years goes by, should the site certificate reflect the what was actually done uh, versus what was granted initially? Um, Yes, David. Just on that point, um, mm -hmm. it's also the phasing because sometimes you 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 don't build them all at once, right? You, you sure you have a facility, it gets it gets approved, and then so that if that can fit in that, I would uh, totally agree. It's one of the areas that you know I, I think does need to be addressed is how we phase projects you know, uh, to get to the overall site certificate build, if you know what I mean. Because customers sure. can't always, you know, take, take, yeah, exactly. If you're gonna if you're gonna go through the FSEC process, you might as well grab a big site certificate. I mean, obviously bigger is more analysis area and all that stuff, but there's some efficiencies to be had by just grabbing a big scoop and then, you know, maybe only build this much, uh, but you had this extra in case. So, but then, you know, th that, that causes issues because 
like, you know, maybe there are sort of compliance stuff related to like vegetation or, you know, if there's nothing built there, then, you know, how do we, as the siting division, how do we ensure, like, do we need to ensure certain types of conditions yeah. were complied with? Because, you know, it says you had, you know, you're going to cut the weeds back this far, but like, you know, it's been 10 years, you didn't build anything there. So we're going to, you know, you agreed to I, do it, but, you know, it's sort of, uh, yeah. My my question or just comment was more on when you build, not if you sure. don't build after a certain amount of time. It's like uh, I I've had several projects in Oregon that you know you get build 100 megawatts now, 200 megawatts in three you know two years later, etc. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, that's what I'm meaning here. Is it's not just sure. when you don't have it; it's also when you have to bifurcate them. You have to you know um, you have to 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 yeah, you have to bifurcate them. You have to you you have to make the 500 megawatt to one 200 megawatt and one 300 megawatt project as an example. And still, all 500 megawatts gets built. That's my my thing is is how do you do that when you haven't had any significant changes in in, in the project? The only difference is is one part got built one year and a couple of years later the other part got built. So that. I'm just saying it's a subcategory of what you were referring to there. Yeah, absolutely. We we wouldn't want to create rules that basically said, oh, well, if you don't build it within six months or something like that, you're then the, uh, the site certificate automatically shrinks to whatever you built, you know, because obviously, yeah, these these things get deployed. Um, it's interesting, just as a side note, you know, like nuclear plants and you know even natural even like natural gas plants can take very long. You have to take multiple years. These solar projects can you know you can throw them up in a, in a matter of months depending on the, the scale um but yeah but but unlike sort of maybe natural gas you know you it, they're much more partial to sort of stage deployment um as you said so like you know phase one phase two um and uh yeah so it's it's an interesting question from a rules perspective you know how do we create rules that sort of reflect that reality um and, you know, and, you know, optimize for sort of all, you know, probable or likely, you know, outcomes of things can be all built all at once or things can be uh, built in a phase, but the, we still want the site certificate to sort of reflect, you know, reality and, and uh, just it makes things easier from an administrative standpoint. Uh, yes, Andy, you have a, you have your hand raised. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was late to the, to the, yeah, I'm, no I'm Andy Bauer with Northwest Natural. Along those lines, it would be beneficial too to have a mechanism in a, in that situation where the site certificate holder could come back to you without having to go into an amendment and say we got an amendment that had you know three separate aspects that we were going to build and we only had been ended up building one or two of those and being able to reconcile those differences in the site certificate without going through an amendment process or working with you guys to do that so that we're not being held accountable for compliance issues on things we haven't developed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean that's I don't I don't have I don't have the answers right this second, but that's definitely something that I uh that we're thinking about and to the extent you care about this issue you should think about as well. Um so yeah I, I agree. That's, that's something that we're looking at. Um so yeah that's that's gonna be some of these are definitely a lot more complicated than others. Um, that's one. That's definitely one of the more uh, complex issues, I think, at this point. I do think there's a, a way forward, but it's not necessarily. Um, we're not going to just get there without thinking about it. Um, so uh, there's probably needs to be some additional clarity on what informations must submit in the preliminary request for amendment, as well as uh, when they want to submit a request to terminate a site certificate. Right, right now, the current description of what has to be submitted is, isn't very specific. So um, just to kind of aid in the process and make sure we do a, a good job, uh, it probably makes sense to provide some additional guidance on what actually has to be in those um, documents um, to uh, yeah, adequately process them in a timely fashion. Um, so, oh, and I'm just clicking next slide, but yeah, as 
people have been raising your hands, that's great. Feel free to just raise your hand or, or uh, um, if you have any uh, thoughts but, uh, about any of the things we're talking about here. So uh, probably needs to, we probably need to address some issues around incorporation of evidence by the applicant. Right now, it just basically it says that you can. And so obviously, you know, logically, rationally, uh, applicants do. They say, you know, we meet this requirement because we met it before. We're not really changing anything. See, see the previous thing and uh, see the original application, which is perfectly allowable by the rules. But the, pro the problem that it, and it does is it sort of forces staff to go back and say like, well, do, does it, is this accurate? You know, we don't just rubber stamp, you know, things that are submitted, we, we verify. Uh, so it makes the verification process challenging. Um, and, then the, and then the public who's already sort of like, you know, this is, this is already very challenging and difficult for, for the public to sort of get their heads around. Um, to the extent they want to participate and identify that maybe things work. You know, the, the prior evidence doesn't support that the amendment meets the standard. So we definitely feel like, you know, you can control C, control V, like you could you can grab what you had before, but but we do feel like maybe there should be some additional rule language that says that you need to specifically identify what it is you're relying on in the prior record to support your claim that the amendment also meets the standards of the original application. Um, so, you know, how do we efficiently, again, this is one of the major reasons why we have an amendment process. A lot of work was previously done that could apply to the existing, to the amendment. Um, and, and if it, if it does apply, then you should be able to grab it or rely on it. But from a practical standpoint, how do we, how do we create rules that, that make that so that people who are reviewing the amendment application don't have to figure out where all that stuff is? to see if they agree. So hopefully that's that's clear, but that's, you know, I think that's, maybe this one's, that one's less complicated, but it is, I do, I do think a significant one. Um, so we feel like there should be some additional rule language relating, or, or some updated rule language around the notice requirements. Uh, again, this sort of related to the application submission issue. We have more flexibility because it's an amendment. So, you know, does it make sense to maybe simplify this process given the reality of how information is shared in 2024? Um, you know, is, is email sufficient for the initial notice? Um, should all reviewing agencies be required to be notified? And this is the complete sort of separate issue. Should all reviewing agencies be required to be notified throughout the process? So it sort of currently lays out that they are, but does that make sense? Should, um, Staff be allowed to sort of identify. Well, only this is only relevant to two agencies, so we're only going to notify these two. There's pros and cons to both approaches, um, but this that's another thing we wanted to look at. Um, and then we want to consider potentially giving council greater flexibility regarding in-person meetings. Currently, the rules basically say that it has to be in person, which is also true of of. Uh, regular application process, but, and that is the goal. Um, you know, we, we like, you know, it's a lot of work, but we do like having the sort of local, the meetings that are tight, you know, in the area of the project to provide people an opportunity to show up, to, to speak to council in person. But, you know, what if there's an ice storm or something like, and we feel like the, a specific meeting isn't super duper important. So should we have, give council greater flexibility in the rules to allow for, uh, remote uh, meetings. Um, so that's just a question I, uh, you know, proposed to the RAC to consider. Uh, we can talk about that some more in a future meeting. Um, so there's going to be some discussion, I'm sure, around the contested case trigger, the contested case process, um, the fact that it's not mandatory. What is What are the implications of that? Um, should it be mandatory? There's, I mean, there, are, there are re, there are pros and cons to it, it being mandatory. From a, I, I think from both, from a developer side and from a, um, the uh, side of the public. So I'm that's this is a rhetorical question at this point. I, I want you to think about that. But um, yeah, sort of think about questions related to the contested case process and how the how it's described in the in the amendment rules and should we should we change it? So there. Are, and I should say, 
you know, I've had I've had discussions with the staff, um, the siting staff on a lot of these, and there are differences of opinion. So the people who are sort of tasked with admit with administering this process uh, themselves, you know, who don't have a, a horse in the race, as it were, uh, have differences of opinion on these. So I, I imagine there's going to be even bigger differences of opinion uh, amongst the members of the RAC, but um, just just as an FYI. Um, consider adding language around construction completion deadlines. Currently, there isn't any. Um, there are construction, there are deadlines for beginning the construction, but there's nothing about, about actually completing it. This is sort of related to the other issue about phasing. Um, so that's certainly something we would want to keep in mind. Um, you know, just throwing this out there, we could have something like, you know, when you do the amendment, you you, you say like, we're going to do this in three phases. So you'd have three deadlines. So it's, we can be flexible. It doesn't have to necessarily, you know, be, uh, you know, super simple or draconian. Um, and then, um, so there's some issues. The, the rules are currently, there's a rule in there about requests um, by persons for amendment to apply later adopted laws. Um, because tradition, you know, the way it's laid out, the site certificate is subject to the laws that were in existence at the time the uh, certificate was granted, for the most part, with some exceptions. Um, there's a process for sort of shifting the window, um, like who pay, who pays, how's that paid for, um, is, is sort of a tricky situation in the in the rules right now. So uh, maybe considering lo looking at that and, and figuring out how to apply that fairly and reasonably. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that was a lot. That was me just, that, uh, that was like, I, I think 30 minutes or so of, of me just saying them and not even really that that thoroughly. I mean, I, I sort of zoom through this. So you can imagine that we could have at a future point, we could have entire racks where we discuss what, how, you know, what language should trigger an amendment? You know, what's an appropriate, you know, what's appropriate for an amendment? Uh, you know, that could be literally, that could be the whole rack. So I'm, I'm going to be, we're going to be very flexible um, uh, <clears throat> in terms of how we go about this. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to make some mistakes here. Uh, when we're all done, I, I'm sure I'll look back and say, well, we probably could have made that two meetings or, or whatever, but I'm going to do my very best. And I'm, and if you guys have thoughts or feelings or like, Hey, I feel like we should have a meeting on just this topic or, or we should, um, you know, stop talking about this other topic that we wasted a bunch of time on. Um, this is, uh, it's not a democracy, but I am, I am looking to, to the RAC members to kind of hear your feedback in terms of what you feel like is, is valuable and useful or whether you feel like, you know, we're wasting time or we should sort of move on. Um, so please give me that feedback. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Um, so in the, in the email I sent about this RAC meeting, I, I I requested that people sort of raise any additional uh, or sort of look at bringing up additional thoughts or feelings of this meeting. If you're not ready for that yet, um, that's totally fine. Um, but if and and you'll see in terms of next steps what I you know what my thoughts are in terms of like how we should approach this the issue of rack issues um, with the amendment rules. Um, but I did want to provide some opportunity now for anybody to sort of add to the list. I mean, I, I gave a bunch of stuff, but if anybody has any sort of additional issues other than the ones that I raised or, um, maybe nuanced takes on, on some of the issues that I brought up, not necessarily solutions per se, but like framing of the issue or some additional thoughts that, that you want people to consider when thinking about how to you know analyze these issues and figuring out a way forward so i'm sort of opening it up to the rack here um if anybody has any thoughts here this is this is about framing issues so that, so you can say please think about these things as as we think about how to make the rules better over the next few rack meetings uh, irene go ahead
Oh, you're you're muted. I see your hand up, but you are you got to take yourself off mute. Okay. Well, uh, she's still on mute. So if anybody else has any thoughts, Irene, if you figure out how to unmute yourself on the phone app, I know it's not something you don't you normally use. Um, we'll go back to you. But does anybody else? Any, uh, uh, Anybody else other than Irene have any thoughts? I have if we don't have any thoughts, oh, go ahead. Tracy Bar Scott. Mm -hmm. So um, when you're talking about framing in different areas, mm -hmm. for triggering an amendment, things like that, are we also talking about land use? Well, as 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 much as it's related to the rules that we're looking at, yes. Okay. So I, think I mean, that, there's... I think that could be a meeting in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's it's real easy to sort of, especially when it's this broad, to sort of, you know, massively do like what I like to call scope creep. But um, I do I do want to be sort of late focused as much as you see. There's so many issues. Uh, I do want to keep this the bubble around the amendment process itself. But to the extent that that is directly related to other rules, then, then yeah, it could include it could include anything really. But insofar as those rules are, are basically either directly reference the amendment process, or are sort of, you know, basically if we make a change to the amendment process, we also have to make a change somewhere else. Otherwise, the rules would now be sort of out of sync. If that makes sense. Sure. Okay, well, I'm now uh, gonna. I, oh, yeah, I, sure. I just have just a couple. I, I think I said the one yeah, already sure. about making sure it's that we're talking not just about, but about phasing. Phasing is a very important part of our, our business and just wanted to make sure that that's in there. And the other one is, um, and it's maybe within that threshold of what is an amendment, but the answer is if it's even so de minimis that it doesn't even trigger an amendment, is there a pro process to happen? As an example, uh, a change in LLC name, a change in company name with the same parent company right now triggers an amendment. And that is that really doesn't have anything to do with citing, has a lot more to do with just uh, uh, an administrative thing. So uh, as long as if, if, if we're talking what triggers an amendment, we're also talking about what process could could be not trigger an amendment but also not uh you know don't lose sight of the super simple um things as long as you're protecting the public and all the all those other things so i just wanted to frame um things like that because i've run across some of those things in, in in my experience yeah that's perfect great that's exactly what i'm yeah. looking for so yeah. are basically are there any pain points where other you know in addition to the ones that david just raised where you're like i can't believe that the rules work like this um they should work differently uh that's what we're here to do so um again and I, i'm not shutting the door on this this conversation right here i just uh, wanted to provide an opportunity now i'm i'm gonna carve out some time over the next before the next meeting where um uh, and we'll get to that in a second but we're we're um hopefully people will be able to think about this some more now that you've seen what staff has sort of identified maybe that will give you some additional you know things to think about like oh i didn't even think that was something we could look at or um that makes me think of this other issue that we also should address um so those sorts of those sorts of things um let's see I don't know why the PowerPoint just decided to stop presenting in Teams, but I'm going to re-click the button here. Um, here. Um, OK, so anybody who is not a member of the RAC, I'm now going to provide um, an opportunity to sort of add your two cents. Again, along the same lines, are there some, are there some pain points in the amendment process or thing, things in the rules that you feel like the RAC should look at? 
Um, that was your opportunity. And again, like even if you're not a member of the Rack, you can always send me an email of like, hey, I think the Rack should look at this or whatever. Um, that's t totally acceptable and appropriate. Uh, but if we give it a minute here. You know, I never know what, how much, how much uh, people are going to bring to the rack. And I know this one's sort of just an introductory one, so I wasn't uh, anticipating a lot of substance here. But as you can see, we have our, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, all right. Well, with that being said, I'm going to lay out here some of the next steps, and I uh of where we're going to go so i'm going to make this powerpoint available uh, it's going to be on the website and uh you'll be able to go look at that um and i if the, if the rack deals will be helpful too i could just i could just make a list like either in a word document or just straight in an email of all the issues that staff is, I, would does the rack feel like that would be useful so you don't have to actually like deal with kind of an unwieldy powerpoint i can just give you a list um that you can just reference um of all of this sort of issues that the staff has identified. Um, and then also this video is going to be uh, as quick as our, our comms team can sort of take the video and put it online, we will do so. Um, I'm I'm thinking, unless the rack feels they need more time, that we ha give the rack until July 5th. I know that's right after the holiday, but it's, I mean, it's sort of the, just where we're at in the year. Uh, yeah, OK, Jack, uh, I'll, I'll do that. Um, do people feel like two weeks here, roughly? Let's see. It's I guess it's only a week and a half. Uh, I, I I hesitate to give like a bunch of time because I know like me personally, I, I'm just gonna if I have a month, I'm just gonna re be, prioritize other things and get to this as the date gets closer. So I don't want to give long timelines if people recognize that they're not gonna spend that much time on this. Uh, and if a, a, shor a shor shorter deadline just means they're gonna get to this sooner. Um, does anybody want more time than July 5th? This is just for uh, any additional issues that you want staff or RAC members to think about or look at. Um, this is your chance to be the squeaky wheel. You know, if you speak now or or you you shall get no grease, uh, for lack of a better expression. Uh, okay, well, with nobody raising any concerns. Sorry. This oh, is oh, Lena. Um, uh -huh. I I think maybe extending that to like the Monday or Tuesday following that holiday because I think I might lose sure. a lot of um, okay. people that week All right. to get input yep. from. So not necessarily a ton of more time, but I don't know how many folks are going to be available to to pull things together that you know fourth and fifth. Yeah, I I, uh, I totally get you. So let, let's do July 9th. Is that okay? Yeah, it's good with everybody. Okay, and again, this doesn't have to be, you're not writing like a college thesis. This could just be, you know, in napkin thoughts. The, the, you know, you're, you're just like, hey, I thought of these two other things I want the rec to look at. Bullet points, boom, done, you send it. So um, please do not feel like you have to do a ton of work for this. Um, but, you know, go through the, go through the rule language. And, uh, and if you've gone through the amendment process before, think back to prior amendments and you know really think like are there any other issues other than the ones that we that i raised here today that you want us to look at uh related to the amendment rule language um so submit that by july 9th and the reason why i wanted to get it quicker is because i want to make sure there's enough time that, that people have time after we submit stuff to the group to look at it so um so then the if uh so then we have some chance. To, so, because I had experience previously that I'm trying to avoid, where we basically have the deadline for submitting stuff right before the next rack meeting. People submit stuff at the last second. No one's had a chance to look at it, and the rack meeting is sort of like feels a little awkward. So um, that's why I wanted to make sure that we sort of have a kind of a maybe a little bit shorter of a deadline to sort of get stuff back to the rack. But then we have another gap where uh, people have a chance to review what's been circulated amongst the rack members. And then we can all have the best, awesomest uh, next rack meeting where people have uh, had a chance to kind of think about stuff. So I'm going to send out a poll, just like I did for this one, for uh, when we would have the next rack meeting. And it's going to be 
two or three weeks after the July 9th deadline for submitting feedback for this RAC meeting. So um, be on the lookout for that poll, um, which at this point I would be sort of towards the end of July. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can sort of get into it, um, sort of raise the, the issues now. Uh, this is going to take a while to kind of chew through. Um, I want to be, hopefully we can sort of be prepared to sort of get into, okay, you know, here's issue one. What, you know, what are we, what, what are our concerns about issue one? And, you know, what are people's thoughts on, you know, what are the solution? You know, how would we, you know, solve this in, in the rule language if we can? Um, so that's going to be the sort of the approach for the next uh, couple of meetings. And then um, once we've sort of done that, gone through, I, I, now that I think about how long it even just took to just describe the problems, it's going to be, it's going to take a couple of RAC meetings to kind of get through that. Um, at which point, Staff's going to really start developing the actual, like what we're thinking we should we should propose. Then I'll submit that to the RAC, uh, and then we'll have it. We'll have a meeting or two to discuss the the red line, uh, what we're staff actually is going to propose. Uh, at which point, um, we'll then present that to council, and they'll we'll start the public comment period. So. That's just kind of the forecast of how things are going to go. I sort of look to you all to just to make that determination on on uh, how long these RAC meetings should be or how many we should have to sort of address each phase of this process. I don't like to do the four, six, eight hour racks. It's really hard for people to carve that out of their schedule. And also just I just find that like personally, you know, once you hit like hour three plus, you know, you're just brain dead. So it's really hard to be productive um, in, especially remotely where we can't like break it up with a lunch or something. Um, yeah, I, I don't like to go too much longer. I'm, we might do like a three hour rack for once we start just hitting the grind of actually getting into the the proposed solutions. Um, because I, I do feel like we, we could spend a, a lot of time on you know various issues. And I want to give them the time they deserve. Um, but uh, yeah, rest assured, I, I definitely, I don't like to, you know, I'm not going to schedule something for eight hours or six hours just for the sake of it. Um, I, yes, I would be very difficult for me to sit through. Um, all right. So at this point, um, if you have any questions about the path forward, I want to make sure we're super transparent. Um, I don't want you to feel like, your feedback is going unheard or that we're sort of zooming along without you understanding what's going on. So please do reach out to me. Uh, I'm going to be reaching out to folks who are unable to attend today to make sure that they uh, know what's 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 going to happen, uh, the path forward, and hopefully they'll be able to attend the next meeting. So um, before we close, does anybody have any questions or any thoughts uh, they want to share with the RAC? Did I go through this time? Oh, you came through, Irene. You did it. Yeah, Irene. Oh, let's let's hear it. Okay, um, just a couple of things, and I haven't spent a lot of time with this, but uh -huh. um, I wanted to suggest that you know there's a state statute that talks about whether or not uh, issues are understandable through the basic. Uh, Population, and I would really like to have the rules say that uh, when you issue notices or have someone look at these rules when we're done to make sure that they meet that standard of being understandable. I, I think it's been an ongoing problem with interpretation. Are you getting sure. a back, lot of back feedback? Yeah, we're getting a little feedback, but I, I heard your question. You want to, you, your, your concern is that when we're done with the, when, with the proposal, we have the draft language that you want to basically have somebody look at to make sure that they, the rules are, are sort of understandable. I, I agree that the rules do need to be understandable, um, but that's one of the reasons why we have, you know, a diverse group here, and I'm looking to, I'm looking to all the RAC members to basically say like, this, this rule is. You used 40 words. You could have used 10. You know this. You mm -hmm. know the, the the advice doesn't always have to necessarily be 
super substantive. You can have sort of like rule advice. I mean, that doesn't hurt my feelings at all. If you, if you, if you feel like, um, you know, you've got a better a way to say something in it that provides the same meaning, but is easier to understand. I'm, I'm please send it my way. Um, so, uh, yeah. So it, the, under the scope, under the clarity section, uh, you know, that was rewriting the rules. So, so not necessarily to change their intent or meaning, but so that people could actually understand them. So that is one of the goals of this rulemaking, but it's an important thing to consider. Another thing, and this is kind of a big issue, but um, when you start having separate rules for amendments, I, and I'm in the middle of a couple of uh, appeals right now that relate to jurisdiction, because jurisdiction, if someone wants to appeal just a, a brand new application, I think is really clearly designated to the Oregon Supreme Court going directly there under uh, 469, what, 503 or 403. When, when you're doing amendments and there isn't a uh, requirement or a, a mandatory contested case with the agency, there are a bunch of court decisions that say things like, and I've been studying this a lot right now, responding, responding to uh, mandamus requests from agency and that from the developer and things like that. But some of the language says things like, uh, and let me run over here quickly and I will read a couple of things from a response that I just recently made. But it says things, the court has said things like, uh, it goes to the Supreme Court under 403 when there is an entitlement to a contested case before the agency. And the argument is when, when you have an amendment rule that allows the council to evaluate a bunch of criteria and they're denying a, a amendment request for contested case, then it isn't an entitlement. And there's also court decisions, more than one that say that for going directly to the Supreme Court under expedited processing, it has to be a challenge to the approval or or denial of a site certificate. So those kinds of things, when you're doing an amendment request and pretty much everyone's being denied contested cases, you can say that uh, according to the rules, this is, and this is true, any appeal goes to the circuit court. So I think that when you're looking at making these rules more um, expedited, you really need to look at how, where the amendments or how the amendments are worded and whether or not you really want to say that during an amendment process, the public has the right to request a contested case before the agency, but they are not and then entitled is the word that they've used in court decisions. So. Uh, I will make sure that you get a list of some of those some of those decisions from the court, but there really should be some consideration given to how many of these cases do you want people to be appealing to the circuit court, and how many do you want to tie them into going to the Oregon Supreme Court? And some of this comes from way back when originally they requested the SAC requested a look at the amendment rules because there was a situation where they denied every uh, amendment request and the council said hey we can identify some areas with amendment rules where people are entitled to a contested case because at the time the council actually apologized to the people saying well our rules say we have to deny these requests, but we don't feel right about it. We'd like to have some rule revision. And this was several years ago when this was brought up. But anyway, I think that whole thing about how many of these cases, where do you want appeals to go, is something that should be considered with amendment rules. Was that too much information? <laughs> no. Um so I'm I'm more familiar with this issue than probably some of the other RAC members are, <laughs> undoubtedly. And I, so I put the bullet point on here of consider how the contested case process occurs. I mean that the issue you just raised about appeals and you know whether things are mandatory or not 
is directly related to, I mean, that's why I put that on there. So it is definitely something that I want uh, The Rock to think about and uh, we will be discussing. So um, thank you for sort of clarifying that issue a little bit. Um, but yeah, just for those who didn't necessarily hear, um, you know, what Irene said, um, uh, there have been some recent court cases that have basically directed how um, appeals to uh, an amendment take place based on whether or not there is a contested case. Um, and so we'll we'll take a look at we'll take a look at that uh, that language and sort of think about you know the best way forward in in terms of do we rewrite the rules so that it sort of addresses the the court. Uh, decision um, based on what the court said, or do we are we okay with just keeping things the way they are, uh, given what the court said about about the current rules? Um, so uh, that'll be one of the things we're, we're going to be looking at. So um, thanks for raising that, uh, Irene. And um, all right, so just think, be thinking about the list that I just laid out, and um, and to the extent you want the rack to think about any other issues or that you wanted to think about additional things related to any of these bullet points as uh, some have raised uh, as Irene just raised with respect to contested case, please send that out by July 9th. Um, and uh, so that the, so that whenever we schedule the next rack, people will have time to review that stuff um, and that we'll be able to get into it at the next rack meeting. So I thank you all so much for giving me your time this morning and for volunteering. Uh, it just makes this process go uh, a lot smoother, and uh, I would be hopeless <laughs> without without your assistance here. Maybe not hopeless, but it's certainly your uh, your assistance is greatly appreciated. So um, I will. Uh, you'll be hearing from me, and uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.